Hey, Heartland Church. Uh, welcome back to our online services. This is week two back being online. Um, I hope you were able to connect with some people this past week. You know, last week we talked about Jesus Christ uh, and that we are sufficient in his sufficiency. Um, and I am really glad uh, that I've been able to study uh, the Bible this week and be grounded in that because I'm not, not going to lie to you, I'm getting a little loopy with the whole COVID-19 thing and some other things that are going on in the world. Um, funny story, my uh, sister-in-law, uh, she told my wife that she had to get out of the house, had to go to a park um, because they live in Texas and their, their son was telling them about all the Minecraft things they were doing. And one of the things they talked about was that he was killing a llama with a grandfather clock. And at that point she was like, yeah, I, I think I need to get out of the house. We, we need to uh, have a break here. So um, now what's funny about that is the llama being killed by the grandfather clock, he didn't call it a grandfather clock. He actually called it an elderly clock. So he was killing a llama with an elderly clock. Uh, that's what he considers grandfathers, evidently. So uh, from now on, I'm going to call every grandfather clock I see an elderly clock because I thought that was, uh, was pretty funny. So um, if you're like me, you're getting a little, uh, little dizzy, a little fuzzy with some of the things going on. However, I am really glad that we have the Bible that doesn't change and that it is, is grounding and we have we serve a God who does not change and so we're going to jump jump back into scripture today and we're going to continue going verse by verse through the book of Colossians and Tim's going to be back next week uh, he's taking some well-needed vacation uh, but wanted to make sure that um, we, we were continuing to grow continuing to um, to meet on Sunday mornings so uh, last week we talked about how uh, Paul prayed this beautiful prayer over the people at Colossae, um, and he was talking about how we're heirs, that God is very powerful, that we're going to have suffering, but also great blessing. Uh, we are of contentment because of his power, and that we are self-sufficient, but that's only because of Christ's sufficiency. And so that was last week. We, we did uh, verses 9 through 14. Today we're going to start with verse uh, 15 and go to verse 18. Uh, I'm going to read the whole passage and then break it down verse by verse. So Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So today I'm going to read out of the new uh, NIV, but I'm also going to switch translations a little bit to the New Living and Amplified as, as needed. Um, we're going to have several truths today, and then we're going to talk about a little bit of practical right at the end. So the first truth we have this morning, I mean, this is very, very rich, this passage about the nature of Jesus Christ. So let's talk about some truths about Jesus Christ. If the entire Bible talks about Jesus Christ and points to him, let's, let's see some truths about that. The first truth we have this morning is that Jesus is man. He's human. Jesus is human. We see in Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 6, we see that though he, that is Jesus, was God, he did not think of being or equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. Jesus is, is, is human. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. <clears throat> Excuse me. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and on, under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it actually has multiple truths in here about Jesus, but Jesus, it clearly says, is human. He gave up, he gave up his divine power and privileges and emptied himself and became a human being. So what does it mean to be human? Well, it means that he ate, he slept, he grew, he felt deep emotions, he had close friends, he had enemies, he was tempted, just like we are. And we don't serve some impersonal God that we can't identify with. He has a personality. And you know, one of the things that's in scripture that is implicit, it's not explicitly stated, but one of the things you see in the gospels is that he, as he was interacting with sinners and, and people, he had to have been a fun person and a very interesting person to be around. Now it doesn't say that in Matthew chapter one, verse one or anything, but it does say that he spent a lot of time 
hanging out, having dinner with sinners. And I don't know about you, but the, the people that I know that are sinners don't like being around people that aren't fun or interesting to be around. So Jesus has a personality and he is, I mean, he does have a personality that people want to be around. He's not some harp in the sky or a very somber Jim Caviezel uh, type character. No, he, he, he's not the way we see it in a lot of Christian movies. But Jesus Christ is a really human. He has a real personality. And some of, of, of who he is is revealed in Scripture. So I encourage you to foster your relationship with Jesus Christ, your personal relationship, so you, you can understand a little bit more about his personality and, and, and understanding him as a person. But also, we don't want to forget that he is a person. But the second truth here is that Jesus is God. We saw that in Philippians chapter 2. Uh, and, and again, this is beyond our human comp comprehension. But we have a trinity where you have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But we also have a truth that God is 100% man. Uh, this is Jesus. Jesus is 100% man and 100% God. It, it, it's mind-blowing. We can't understand this, but the Bible is clear about both. Now, Christ is not just some other man, not just another teacher, not just another religious leader. He is God himself. Look at Colossians 1, chapter uh, 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Christ, as the visible image, is the exact likeness. That's what this meant, that, that's what it means here. Is, uh, he is himself God. In John chapter 14, Philip asked, uh, Jesus, he said, Lord, show us the Father, and it'll be enough for us. And what was Jesus' response? He said, Philip, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. He, I and the Father are one. He's saying, I'm God. Colossians uh, 2, verse 9, in another chapter, it says, and For in him the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. Now, the Greek word for Godhead, this theotis, doesn't just mean the attributes of God. It actually means the divine and essence and personality of God, the same substance or essence. Now, remember, Christ didn't say he had the bread or he had the water of life. No, he said, I am the bread of life. I am the water. I am the door. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. There is no need to look anywhere else for that which can help and satisfy us. Christ is God. He, Christ is creator. And he is God come to earth in bodily form. Looking at uh, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 15 in the New Living Translation. Christ is the visible image, the invisible God. He in, existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Now, if Christ were a created being, he'd have to create himself. But if he is the creator, then he is supreme over all creation. And you know, I read, when I prepare for these sermons, I read Bible commentaries and I read uh, Bible dictionaries and I, I do all that stuff. But sometimes uh, it's fun to uh, get a new perspective on something by asking little children. So I, I asked uh, several children th this past week about what it means to be supreme. Some people didn't know. Uh, these little kids. Uh, some kids talk about pizza, okay, which I also like supreme pizza. Great. Uh, and then I asked my, my son Donovan, and I said, what does it mean to be supreme? And this is what he said. He said, ruler, almighty. I was like, yeah, great answer. And then I said, hey, uh, give me an example about who is supreme. And he was like, well, you are. You're pretty smart. I was like, yes, father of the year. And he's like, well, I guess God. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's a good answer too. So yeah, my, my son said that God is supreme. He's the ruler. He is almighty. Well, that is what Jesus Christ is. That uh, An attribute of God is that he is supreme. And that this, this says this about Jesus Christ. So uh, then to make sure that we get it, Paul goes on in verse 16 and continues. He says, For in him, that is Christ, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He kind of says it pretty clearly there. So only God can create all things. Now think, of, think for a second, what is all things? Well, is it the things we see? Yes. Is it the people? Well, yes. 
but it's more than the trees and the mountains or the stars and the galaxies and solar systems and everything. This, this is the totality of everything. And so electricity, radiation, gravity, magnetism. You know, as a science teacher, one of the things I have to teach for my, my kids is electricity and magnetism. And it's super neat because electricity, when it's flowing through something, creates magnetism. And if you take magnets and move them, you can actually create electricity. Uh, that's it's mind blowing how those two things are related. You take ele electricity, magnetism, and gravity, and those are several forces that can act over a distance without actually having to come in direct contact with somebody. Because normally when I have to apply a force to something, I have to push it, physically touch it. But those forces can act without even touching something. It just acts in, in fields, which is crazy how God was so smart that he put all this together. He is the creator, not only of things, but also these wild scientific concepts and things he's put together. All, every dimension, everything is, is a creation of Jesus Christ. Romans 11 Verse 36 says, for from him and through him and for him are all things. We say that again. For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Everything is for him. Everything is from him. And everything is through him. You know, in Colossae, the Gnostics were teaching a sort of higher thought philosophy where they worship angels as intermediaries between God and, and man, and they really tossed out that supremacy thing of Jesus Christ. Uh, we also live in a world today that tosses out the supremacy of Jesus Christ and magnifies individual intelligence and things like degrees. Now, I, I have multiple degrees, and at the end of my last degree that I had to get for education to be a, an administrator in education, uh, right at the end of it, I don't have a doctorate, but the person who was had a doctorate said, well, you can't have an opinion. You don't have a, a doctorate yet. And I looked at him and probably didn't have a very nice look on my face. But the truth is, is that people today elevate their own intellect and elevate people with PhDs. That They elevate this, this intelligence more than the Bible, more than the supremacy of Jesus Christ. And they think that if they can't comprehend it, then it obviously isn't true. Now, um... It is, I mean, it's important to study. It's important to, uh, to continue to grow. But we, we've got to make sure that we don't place our intellect at the top of the food chain of truth. Because then if you can't understand it, then you are the one, you are actually on top of, of being supreme, your intellect, not Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to make sure that when you look at the truths, you're not thinking, well, yeah, I don't know if I believe that because how could a virgin conceive and give birth to Jesus Christ? Well, it, a person who puts their intellect on the top shelf and makes that supreme doesn't understand that. That can't be true. Therefore, it's not true. Well, that is denying the truths of the Bible. So I encourage you to not put your intellect higher than the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the creator. And from him, through him, and for him are all things. So Jesus is this 100% man. He is 100% God. He is the creator. Here comes your third truth this morning, that Jesus is the sustainer of his creation. We see in verse 17, he is before all things and in all things, or in, I'm sorry, in him all things hold together. So if you look at the science of the universe again, why doesn't the earth crash into the sun? Well, it has to do with gravity because gravity is attracting them together. It also do, has to do with how fast they're moving because the, the actual motion is trying to send earth off into space. But those two things are balanced because Christ is the one holding it together. Why don't we all get sucked into a cosmic black hole? Because Christ is holding it together. He is the sustainer of his creation. It is not in chaos. There may be crazy things because of sin that go on, but he is, he is in control of his creation. So in verse 17 it says, He existed... Before anything else, he holds all, th all creation together. You know, he is concerned and aware of everything going on. And that's why you can trust him. And he holds it all together. He is the glue. You know, in college, uh, we, we talked about last week how I had a, a car in college where the key got snapped off. 
Well, I also have another story about a college, um, a car in college. Later on in college, I had a Jeep, and I loved the car too. Um, and I was going to a formal dance with a girl. Uh, you'll, it's not my wife, and you'll find out why here in a moment. Uh, but I, we're going to the dance. Uh, I went to open my car. When we got to the dance, uh, opened the car door, uh, and the door fell off. Um, needless to say, this super impressed my date that night, um, and it's not my wife. But the way I got put it back on was that I closed the door, and I rolled down the window and the back window just a little bit, and bungeed it shut so that it would actually stay on. And that was the only thing holding the door on. And that's kind of how I think about it when I, I think that there are things that would come off the hinges and that would just fall off if Jesus weren't sustaining his creation. Now, for some of you that want to email me this week and talk about the, uh, the fact that Jesus Christ is much more supreme than some redneck bungee cord that you put on a Jeep that's falling apart in college at a formal dance, I, I get it. I get that it's, it's much bigger than that. But there is no reason that door should have, been hold, should have not fallen off had it not been for that bungee cord. And there, there's no reason why all the rails wouldn't come off if Jesus Christ took the day, day, took the day off and said, Nope, I'm just not going to sustain my creation today. He is actively involved in his creation. So, um, so I encourage you to think about the, the truth about how God is constantly in motion and he's constantly acting to sustain his creation, actively thinking and caring for you. Fourth truth I have for you this morning about Jesus is that Jesus is the head of his church. We see in chapter eight or verse 18, we see, and he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. What does your head do? Well, your head gives your, your nourishment. It's the place where all your guidance and your direction comes from. Uh, that's your, it's your head. You, without your head, the rest of the body doesn't function. Everything you ever need is found in, in Christ. It says that he's the creator and that he is the head and that he's the one that gives us guidance, direction, and, and we are parts of his body. And so we should love not only Jesus Christ, but also the other parts of the body too. So I want to read you a, a passage out of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and it talks about us, meaning the church, the people who have given their faith in Jesus Christ, being the body of Christ, with him as the head. So let me read in, in 1 Corinthians 12. Starting with verse 12, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all of its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the, the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Verse 15, now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, stop being a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. And I can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. All the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But the God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. And so there should be, never, there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. In the last verse here, in verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of it. You know, we are designed by God to need each other. And Jesus says that the greatest commandments was to love God and to love other people. Now, most of the commandments in Scripture can't be done unless we, we're around other people. We can't forgive we can't serve, we can't encourage, we can't love, we can't be kind, we can't bear with one another, we can't be unified with one another, we can't be patient, long-suffering, endurance with one another if we're not around other people. And one of our mission here, or our mission here at Heartland Church is to connect hearts to God and to other people. So the practical here at Heartland uh, 
church that I have for you today is to be connected to the rest of your body. Now, we are all given gifts and different talents and different uh, passions and different experiences, things that have shaped us in different ways. So we're not all of us are going to be a finger, but some of us are going to have different areas where we, we do different services, different ways that we connect, different ways that we transform. We all have different personalities, which, which is wonderful, but we are all part of one body with Christ as the head. So I'd like to talk about some specific ways that we can get connected to the body right now. So, and I know that it's hard because we've been limited a little bit with COVID-19, but these are some ways that we can do it right now. Uh, and hopefully going forward, we can, we can ex just expand on these. So there's the Sunday morning service, uh, which is, is Sunday morning. Uh, we're trying to do things uh, live on Facebook and, and YouTube for you to be able to connect and engage that way right at 10 o'clock. It's also posted where you can watch it at any time. So um, Tim uh, is getting back next week, um, and we've been implementing some things along the way, is that we've been giving out an outline for the Sunday, uh, Sunday service. We've also been giving a midweek sermon and connecting that to our Sunday morning service. And it's, this week, for example, it's going to be focusing on going a little bit deeper about picturing the entire Bible together from Genesis to Revelation when it comes towards Jesus Christ being the center of all of it. And everything points towards the center. So you have ways that you can grow in Jesus Christ and grow, uh, grow in your knowledge and transform to be more like him through some of these, these avenues. We also have some ways that we can still, uh, we can still uh, worship. We can do that online. We can still give. We can do that online. Uh, the care groups, several of them are still me meeting during this time. Uh, the care group questions that we are homegrown uh, writing throughout the week are, are being sent to everyone now. So it's not just for care groups. If you're an individual who wants to go through some questions with somebody, sit down with your spouse. Sit down with your, your kids. Sit down with just a friend and say, hey, let's go through the questions this week. So this is a way for you to engage throughout the week. Um, we are also going to start. Uh, it's been said multiple times. We'd love to, you all would love to hear from the pastors on, more on social media. Uh, so we have decided that um, I know I'm going to start posting a little bit more on social media and by a little bit more and since I have done it none if I do that once then I have satisfied that um, July 18th this coming Saturday uh, we are going to do a trunk and eat at 6 p.m. where we all drive to the church uh, we get lawn chairs out in the back we bring food and we, we have, just have a good time getting to see each other in person but doing it outside to where, where it's safe so um, there's the, you know there, there's some serving opportunities that are going to be coming up there are ways for us to still be engaged here at Heartland Church. And we may not be able to do everything we, we want to because of COVID. Um, we are still the church, and we are still supposed to be focused on the gospel, on connecting with one another, on transforming to be more like Jesus, and we are blessed to be a blessing to other people, just like Abraham way back in Genesis. And so starting with our church family, we, we need to be those things to our church family. And, and outwardly, but also especially focused right now because I want to make sure that we, we connect with those people that we aren't able to see face to face. You know, verse, uh, verse 18 says, And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he, that is Jesus, might have the supremacy. We serve an awesome God, and we are connected to him because he is the head of the body, but we are connected to one another as well. So I'm going to speak a blessing over you as we, uh, as we wrap up here. I pray that this week you understand to a greater extent than you ever have that God is so powerful and so holy and also that he loves you so much that he wants a personal relationship with you. And when you enter this relationship, you become part of his body with him at the head. And then you get to function within your gifts and your passions serving as a part of his beautiful church. May you grow in your understanding of that this week. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Bless you.
Please.